Um, uh, you know, Justin Coslin has got a remarkable uh, background and has a remarkable uh, uh, assignment. He's called a product manager at Google Ideas, but the product that he has to manage is the exploration of how technology can enable people to confront threats in the face of conflict, instability, or repression. And, uh, you know, he has led this strategy around the development and launch of the Global Human Trafficking Hotline Network. And he's also, uh, you know, designed improvements uh, and launched improvements around Google News, Google AdSense, Google Docs, uh, and, and other areas. Um, you know, he, he is generous with his time and is giving back in lots of different ways. And I know that he's teaching an undergraduate seminar at Yale on technology design for global challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, he is a computer science major from Yale, um, uh, where he graduated summa cum laude and is a member of the Phi Beta Kappa uh, Society. He's been active with um, uh, important groups like the Carnegie Council on Ethics um, and other uh, institutions. And he's been giving me some advice around the launch of our uh, uh, Sipa Dean's challenge, and I thank him for his interest, and I really am delighted you're here to share with us a little bit about what you're doing and what you think, uh, you know, technology can do uh, around uh, global challenges of the sort you're engaging. So thank you so much. Well, I have to say, this Justin Costlin guy sounds pretty good. I wish I could meet him. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Dean, for the very generous introduction and uh, invitation to be here. And thank you all for coming today. Um, if I may, I'd actually like to begin with a question. Uh, since you're all the, the user, the, the consumer, the audience, the participants in this talk, why are you here? What brought you here? What do you hope to get out of today? Anyone want to share why you're here? Don't be shy. Well, I work specifically on development issues in my job um, around conflict, and that's my specialty with the company. And we're interested in looking at this point how tech can be used and specifically how it can be integrated with what people already do. Hmm. How people handle their, these situations themselves. Good question. Anyone else, please? I've got a project I'd like you to invest in. I appreciate the candor. <laughs> Maybe one, one more data point? Why are you here? Yes, please. Great. Cool. Well, I'm here in part because Dean Jano very graciously invited me, but I'm also here partly because of the police. Don't worry, not like that. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I was sitting in a conference room not far from here, and I was trying to figure out how technology could make life better for the interactions between citizens and police, uh, particularly in parts of the world that are pretty tricky, where there's conflict, there's instability. Um, and I was trying to look at how technology could improve oversight, could improve accountability, reduce crime, mobilize neighborhood watches. And I was getting nowhere. And the reason I was getting nowhere is because I was not the target user. I don't live in a part of the world that's like the parts of the world I was trying to help. And my colleagues are not the target users. They also don't live in the parts of the world that are like the parts of the world we are trying to help. So sitting alone in a conference room, spitballing ideas, we were engaging in something called self-design. Self-design, which means we were basically designing for ourselves rather than for the people we are trying to help. And self-design is not a good idea. Self-design is the road to failure, because you're, end up, you're going to end up building something that's not actually going to be relevant to the facts on the ground. Self-design is endemic, and it's pernicious. Think about it. How many projects have you worked on personally in your life where the key decisions were made based on the boss's personal opinions, basically in a vacuum, right? where there's no ground truth? I bet it's happened a fair number of times to you. It certainly happened to me. So before we can talk about using technology to improve policing, 
we have to talk about using technology, full stop. We need to talk about getting away from self-design. We need to build a toolkit of technology design techniques that we can then apply to fighting conflict and instability and repression. I'm curious, raise your hands if you've heard of product management. Not project management, but product management. Raise them high. OK, only a few folks. No worries. I hadn't heard of it either until I basically accidentally applied for a job doing it on the Google website because I'd been rejected for a software engineering internship the summer before. So many tech companies, including Google, product managers are responsible for deciding what to do and how to do it and turning ideas into plans into results. And we often lead teams of all sorts of folks, engineers, marketers, lawyers, user experience designers, PR folks, policy folks, to name a few. So the background requires a little bit of proficiency with basic computer science, and it requires a curiosity about user needs. What do people actually want from their technology? So I spent a few years as a product manager in Google's California mothership. And that time helped equip me to design technology to fight conflict, instability, and repression. I've worked on Google Docs, ads, social initiatives, Google News. I've drunk the Kool-Aid, learned to idolize clear goals, user feedback, rapid iteration, and learned to hone in on what we call the MVP, minimum viable product. Just like in sports, MVP in tech is a good thing. And you may have also heard the phrase MVP if you watch HBO's new show, Silicon Valley which for the most part is not entirely accurate, but they got that thing right. So you might not think that product management is something you need to help fight conflict, instability, and repression, but I'm here to tell you that if you want to make technology work, good product management is as necessary as electricity. No exaggeration. So today, I'm going to try to compress years of lessons I learned in Silicon Valley into a single, hopefully electrifying case study and then we'll use those lessons to tackle some of those challenges. Everyone ready? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Whoever said that, I appreciate that. So I'm going to try to plug this in. This is our first practical technology demonstration of the day. It's called projecting. And if we can get it to work, then all things are possible. And if we can't get it to work, then we will iterate, as one does in technology. You know, there's an old joke. How many Google product managers does it take to make PowerPoint work? Infinite. <laughs> That's right. That's why we invented Google Docs. Um, so how many folks here use Google News, actually? So a few of you. So do you use the personalization features? You know, the sliders where you can say, give me more world news and less entertainment. Or maybe vice versa. I, I won't judge. Um, so I worked on that, those sliders. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to walk through some of the iterations. So you can actually see, for a single feature, the sort of life from beginning to middle to end of how we did what we did. So what you're looking at right now is this was the interface when I joined the team for personalization. So this was a box that lived about halfway down the page. Uh, you can see it's called News For You. Not always clear what that means necessarily. The closed box is sort of floating in this weird way where you might expect, expect to see the closed box. There's this view as. And it's not clear if this view as applies to just these settings or it applies to the entire page. Uh, you can add a news topic. Um, it's unclear what a news topic is versus the section. Uh, you can reorder things with this, although most people don't know that that's reordering. I don't know if you would think of that as reordering. Maybe you would. Uh, you can set never, sometimes, always. Um, it's not necessarily clear what sometimes versus always means. Um, and the word personalization is only used once on the entire page. Do you guys see where it's used? Very bottom, reset personalization. It's the only time that we talk about this being personalization. Um, so do you think users really fully understood what this interface was allowing them to do? No. So the term for this is a user interface, because it's basically the interface that a user uses to do whatever they want to do. And in this case, what they might want to do is change their Google News. But we were not making it as easy as we could. And so we were not seeing as much personalization as we could. And so users were using it less than they might otherwise. So we had a goal, which was make this easier to use so more people would use it, so more people would be happy with the product. So I stayed up a little bit late one night, and I made this mock. So what was the difference between this one, which was actually what was on the page, and this, which was me fiddling around in fireworks, Adobe Fireworks, and trying to envision what a better interface could look like? 
you guys see? So shout out. What are some of the differences? Yep, that's one. Yep, got rid of the text. A lot shorter. I also got rid of that Xbox because I realized there's already the done here. So you don't need the X as well. It's two ways of doing the same thing. Just give them one way. OK, so I'm going to keep going. So here's another change. So what was the difference here? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I played around with a bunch of different options. And for each of these different options, and you can see some of the different ones here, I would show them to a half dozen, a dozen normal folks, people who were not Google engineers, not Google product managers, because I am not the normal user of something like this. When I look at something like this, I look at it as a product manager, not as somebody who's more of a mainstream user. And so I would just get out there. It takes half an hour to make this mock. It's not a huge lift. And so I'd run around different buildings, flag down strangers, ask them for two minutes of their time, and just say, hey, if you saw this and you wanted more health news, what would you do? And sometimes they would say, oh, I'd click this button. Sometimes they'd say, heck, if I know, health news? And then I knew that I had a problem. So keep iterating. Here's another iteration. Here's another iteration. Here's another one. So it's very cheap to do these. It's just you know, half an hour for each of these. And so you can do a bunch of them. You can be creative. You can try different things. And you can see, when we got to this one, we finally had something that people more or less understood. Right? It's very clear what the goal is, personalize your news. It's very simple layout. Adding a new section is sort of at the bottom. We give some examples of new sections. Uh, there's the sliders. There's you know reset. We call this save instead of done, because people were saying, wait a sec, it's not saving, even though it was saving every single time they did something. So we had something that was stable. And we, I should mention, um, part of how we got here is also there was someone on the team who was in operations named Anna Santos. She did like a two-day training, like a crash course training on user experience research. And she went off and she did a bunch of these research cycles on her own as well. So it doesn't take a PhD to do this kind of thing. You can learn very quickly how to get this kind of iterated feedback and converge on something that people understand in a matter of weeks. So once we had this stable, then the question was, OK, how does it fit into the rest of the page? So I mentioned that it was midway down the page originally. So right, this is Google News. This is the main column. So this was where it sat when I joined the team. It was at the end of the top stories and before the sections. And that was OK. Um, but there was a question of, what's the interaction model when you click Save? Like, where does it go? Does it just sort of fold into the middle of the page? Or, or what happens to it? So one idea that I mocked up, this was a pretty bad idea. <laughs> you guys see what I did there? <laughs> a flying link. I was saying, what if, we, what if somehow this link, when you click Save, like becomes a setting saved, and then somehow that magically flies up to the top right? Would you guys use something like that? You can be honest. Yeah, it's really crazy. It was a terrible idea. I apologize for what I was drinking when I made that. Um, and then, of course, there's, if you do something like that, there's a question of if you click Edit Personalization again, where does it reopen? Does it fly back to the middle of the page and reopen the middle of the page? That would be probably a little bit confusing. Maybe it reopens just at the top right here. Well, wait a sec. That's a little bit of prime real estate, maybe two prime real estate. Maybe it can open on the top right. And when we got to this, we finally found something that worked. And when we showed it to people, they understood it. We were able to prototype it. And uh, we added a couple features, like uh, favorite sources. And we launched it. And the whole thing took about maybe six months end to end. I'm going to turn this off now. Um, and so that's sort of a little bit of an example in how you can go from an idea and a goal to a whole bunch of different iterations, to something that seems to work, uh, to something that you can get feedback on, to something that's live. And there's actually one step that I forgot to mention as well, which is a dog food. So dog fooding, I don't know if any of you have heard the term. Does anyone? No. So dog fooding is basically it comes from the phrase, eat your own dog food. So in other words, consume what you produce. And so uh, it's very common in tech companies, where basically before a product is launched to the world, we launch it internally. So you have, what, 40,000 people at Google, including quite a few Google News users. So before we would launch something like that publicly, we launch it to the 40,000 Google News users. We ask them for feedback. We log whether they actually interact with the thing. And we're able to figure out both qualitatively and quantitatively, is this working? And so that's another one of the steps where you get that kind of quick feedback before you have to go live to everybody. Does that make sense? So it's the same philosophy. It's just different ways of getting feedback really quickly and really easily and expanding the circle of users each time that you're confident that it's good enough for the current circle. 
So that is the Google News example in a nutshell. And the whole process end to end took about mm, six months. Uh, and maybe a dozen people or so were involved. And now it's being used literally by millions of people around the world. Um, and you know, someday soon, I hope that somebody else comes along at Google and does another round of improvement on it and takes what I did as a starting point and takes it to a level even beyond that. Because it's always an iterative process, and you're never going to be fully done. So the process iterates the philosophy, which is iterating quickly towards the minimum viable product. And as the example showed, a lot of the technologies that exist today, both in software and even in tools like Adobe Fireworks, make it very easy to whip up a mock-up, whip out a prototype. Uh, and so it would be irrational to simply debate ad nauseum what to do in a hermetically sealed room when, you can, so when it's so easy to get feedback from the world. Another very short example of this philosophy in action comes to us from the Google Chrome team. Any Google Chrome users here? Me too. It's a great browser, right? Yeah. So one of the things that they do to make it a great browser is they have three what are called branches of the code. So the first branch is called the canary build. And it's basically a very, very rough build that they update every single night. So every single night, there's a new version of the canary build of Chrome based on all the little experiments that they're trying and all the ideas they're trying out. And it's a way for them to get feedback really quickly and really easily. Every night, they can get feedback on a new build. Not a lot of people use the canary build, only people who sort of opt in to seeing the bleeding edge. But it's enough for them to get a little bit of a sense of, is this directionally working? The second branch is called the beta channel. And that they update, I think, every week or two. And so that's where, if there's a feature that's on track to be released publicly, it can go live to all the beta channel users. It's a bigger set than the canary build. Gives them more feedback, more metrics on whether it's working. And then every, I think, month and a half or so, they launch a full build. Uh, and this is for everybody. So every single one of us that uses Chrome, it's automatically updated every month and a half or so uh, to take into account all of the little experiments they've been running and all the improvements they've been making on this first two channels. So I hope that that's another example uh, that sort of takes that same exact philosophy of really quick iteration and extending the scale as you go um, in a slightly different context. Beta users, I should mention, are so great that I had a few for this speech. So kudos to Brendan, Scott, and Jared at Google Ideas, as well as Carl Forsberg, Alex Kaufman, and my family for helping me refine the minimum viable product of this talk. Iterating can happen in many guises. And in fact, I would say that whether you realize it or not, every single one of you are already product managers in some part of your life. You, I'm sure, take this exact philosophy in some of the things that you do today. All you have to do is to find a clear goal, experiment quickly with various approaches in the real world, and scale your best solution. And along the way, don't be afraid to fail fast. As you saw with my mock-ups, some of your ideas are going to fail. And if you're going to experiment with flying text, better that you learn very quickly that that's a bad idea than that you spend a long time working on it before throwing it away. In a nutshell, that's product management 101. Congratulations, you all get course credit. <laughs> right, Dean? <laughs> so at this point, you might be wondering, all right, that's all well and good, but how does that apply to conflict, instability, and repression? There's a little bit of a bait and switch here in this talk. We came to learn about conflict, not Google News. Hold your horses. <laughs> Let's get back to the police, back to the beginning. If you were in my shoes trying to design a tool to increase oversight and accountability for policing in conflict situations, where would you start? What questions would you ask? Shout it out. Based on what we just talked about. Go to a conflict situation. Go to a conflict situation. This man gets an A. <laughs> Fantastic. That's exactly right. What is the minimum viable product? Who are the users? What's the tool? You can only answer these questions by going to a conflict situation and seeing for yourself. So I got on a plane to Rio de Janeiro. And for those who don't know, 6 million people live in Rio. Actually, has anyone here been to Rio or is from Brazil? Oh, cool. So you know better than I. You could come up and tell everyone this. No? OK. I'll give it a thumbnail. Um, over a million people in Rio, out of the 6 million total residents, live in favelas. So these are slums, urban slums that are scattered around the city in different pockets. And you got to realize, a lot of folks who live in favelas, you know, they work in office buildings and restaurants. They, you know, they're just sort of normal folks. They're not necessarily associated with any illicit activity or any conflict activity. But they happen to live in an area that, instead of being run by city government, 
is run by a group with a name like the Red Command, um, and that does engage in uh, often narcotics trafficking, uh, and that does do various other illicit activities. And I should also mention that these favelas are somewhat off the grid. So they don't have official electricity necessarily, don't have official internet. It's all sort of grafted illegally from the city infrastructure. So the Olympics and the World Cup are coming up in Rio uh, quite soon now. And so the government in Rio needed to improve the accountability and the, ultimately the effectiveness of the police in the favelas. So they started six years ago a new police force called the UPP, the Unit of Pacifying Police. And this was basically started totally from scratch. Uh, they wear different uniforms that are kind of this baby blue. 30% um, of them are women. Uh, they do uh, community-oriented policing with like foot patrols and dispute mediation. They take kids on sightseeing trips in the city. They organize debutante balls. Uh, it's really not necessarily what you would think of as traditional Brazilian sort of heavy-handed policing. It was a clean start. And, um, and there's a local think tank down in, in Rio that, that helped set up the itinerary for my trip called the Igarape Institute. And they were interested in collaborating with us to see if there is a way to use technology for good to help the UPP be more accountable, have better oversight, and ultimately be more effective at building trust with these communities that have never really seen police before. So the first step was to figure out who our users were. Could we design a tool for everyday citizens, local leaders, church groups, UPP? After visiting with representatives of all those groups, it basically looked like only the UPP had the breadth and depth and willingness to be a sort of first target user population for something that could be scaled easily and rapidly across different favelas in the city. So the question is, for any project to be worth doing, it would need to seriously combat corruption and mistrust. And so what technology could do that? Anyone want to throw out any ideas, maybe based on inspiration right here in New York City? based on inspiration of what the NYPD is doing to rebuild trust with communities that don't take it seriously anymore on a trustworthy perspective? Anyone remember the news from a couple of years ago? Yes? Uh, they, they were frisking in the, uh, the high-rise uh, uh, ghetto. Mm -hmm. Yep, so stop and frisk was a challenge. And what was the solution that a judge mandated as a remedy? Partly, but there was a there was a technology-driven aspect. Does anyone remember? So body-worn cameras, body-worn cameras. Anyone want to shout it out? Pretend I didn't say that. Body-worn. Yes, that's right. Good memory. Um, and body-worn cameras, you know, were a, a remedy that a federal judge ordered the NYPD to use to basically create an audit trail of what the police were doing. And when there were incidents, sort of what the backstory was, what the context was, not just the moment of the incident itself, but what led up to it. Because a body worn camera that's part of the officer's uniform that's always on, that the officer doesn't have the ability to turn off, creates that kind of trail. And if it somehow mysteriously stops working that day, that's a pretty strong a priori signal that maybe the officer isn't entirely in the right. Um, so we were really driven and inspired by that model of the body worn camera. But there's a hitch which is body-worn cameras made of custom hardware are, are pretty expensive. Um, and there was no judge mandating their adoption and use in, the, in the, the favelas of Rio. So what to do? Anyone want to throw out a proposal? Try to make cheaper ones. Try to make cheaper ones. OK. That's, that's the start. Yes. Yes. Good man. You want to hold it up higher so people can see? He's holding up a smartphone. Think about it. This is a camera, it's a microphone, it has Wi-Fi, it has 3G, it has Bluetooth, and it even has other hardware, like it has an accelerometer. So it knows if it's flat, for example. Right? And if it was affixed to an officer's vest and the phone were flat, that would mean the officer were flat. And so if the phone were flat for five seconds, maybe the officer is down. You could imagine a little red dot pinging in the um, headquarters of the police saying, you know, this officer with this name uh, you know, is possibly down at this position. And by the way, we're going to automatically start a live stream from his uh, camera so that if there is an incident, a violent incident happening in real time, maybe you could save his life. So the theory is that if we can design a, a product that's cheap, that uses off-the-shelf Android smartphones, and that could save a life, maybe we could get officers to, to adopt it without a judge's order. 
So that is basically the state of play. The idea is still in development. Uh, it's with funds from DFID, uh, the British aid agency. Uh, the Igarapa Institute is currently piloting it in several favelas with plans to adopt it and scale it both within Rio and to other countries. And the initial field trial results have been encouraging. So in that story, we'll do questions in a bit. Sorry. Uh, we see many of the same dynamics that we saw in Google News. Right? We see clear goals. We see real users. We see quick feedback from these field trials that are, being ha that are happening every week in the favelas right now. And we see the potential to scale. So it's the same ingredients we keep seeing. But this time, it's applied to a global challenge, in this case, police accountability. Let me give you another example, this time about human trafficking. Human trafficking is a major challenge. You have tens of millions of victims around the world and survivors, and tens of thousands of grassroots religious organizations, police units, secular shelters, uh, all sorts of different responders all over the world that have the ability to potentially both help survivors and victims and bring perpetrators to justice. And so, in partly, we're talking about an information problem where you have to match make between those with resources and those with needs. And technology is good at information problems of that kind of nature. Um, it's also worth flagging, though, that there are quite a few different users to think about. In the first case, you know, we really had officers and citizens. When we're talking about human trafficking, you have policymakers, providers of victim services, law enforcement units, victims, survivors, among others. And they all have different needs and inclinations. So for example, a policymaker like, might like a big heat map that they can use to try to figure out very macro patterns. Uh, a law enforcement officer might want a tactical tip that's been very well vetted that they can act on. A funder, which is another user type I didn't mention earlier, might like a success story. They want to be able to say, look, our, our money's making a difference. And so each of these different users has a different need. And a lot of projects have been undertaken in, in fighting human trafficking, some of them very successfully. But it's hard to figure out a way to make it work for all those different user groups. And often, if it's hostile to one of those user groups, they can effectively veto it. So it was a very, um, we were very cautious in how we approached fighting human trafficking to try to make sure that we were, we were finding a model that could really fit with all those different needs. A show of hands here. Who here has heard of Polaris Project? Ah, excellent. Some folks have. So they're based in DC. And for those who don't know, they run the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, which is primarily a phone-based hotline, also email, web form, SMS. Uh, they got 20,000 calls last year. And they track 150 variables or fields of information for every case. So they have a very rich, very structured data set. And their secret sauce is that they've mapped out 3,000 local service groups across the country. And so they know the track record of each of those. So if they get a call in rural North Dakota about labor trafficking, they know, OK, these are the folks who really are expert at handling a labor trafficking case in this part of North Dakota. Um, and that kind of secret sauce has been incredibly effective they, they use a very modern technology stack, salesforce.com and Palantir, among others. And uh, some of the insights they've been able to find really would surprise you. Um, if you ever had someone knock on your doorbell, try to sell you a magazine, it turns out that there's, there's uh, considerable human trafficking and forced labor in that industry. And it's seasonal. So in the summer, it's more in the north. And in the winter, it's more in the south. Makes sense because of the weather. But they can show you that specifically on a heat map and get, give you a sense of, whoa, why are no regulators looking into the labor dynamics of this industry? They can also show you, for example, the high risk of trafficking among J-1 visa summer workers. So these are folks who come to the US for a summer. And because they're here temporarily, because they have to have certain paperwork, they're very vulnerable to exploitation. And so Polaris has even been able to work with the State Department to get new trainings for these workers in their home countries before they even come to the US to warn them the risks, explain to them what their rights are, explain to them what they can do if they find themselves in a sticky situation. It's a very data-driven model, and it's very effective. And it yields calls from 107 foreign countries to the US National Anti Trafficking Hotline, the majority of countries on Earth calling an American domestic hotline. When I learned that, I was really quite surprised and troubled in some ways, because weren't there other domestic lines in those 107 foreign countries that people could be calling instead of trying to call the US line? It turns out often the answer is no, uh, at least not in the data-driven way that Polaris manages the domestic line. And you know, Polaris is an unusually flat organization. It delegates very well. 
they have a very small team that sort of thinks like a Silicon Valley startup. Uh, and so they're able to have a couple people play with new technologies, find a model that works, and scale it very quickly to the rest of the organization. Um, and so I've been working with Polaris for the last couple of years to figure out, is there a way to scale their model globally? To basically put a bow on the way that they use technology, the way that they train people, the practices they have, and share that with other hotlines in other parts of the world that are also facing this challenge, but don't have yet have the, the benefit of that kind of data-driven techniques. And so that project has been going on for about a year. Uh, and the goal is, is both tactical coordination on specific cases and strategically being able to pool the data in an apples-to-apples -apples way, aggregated, anonymized, and actually get for the first time a real sort of reference point, gold standard data set, on the dynamics of human trafficking around the world. So that if you saw, for example, a certain kind of labor trafficking decrease in one country, you'd be able to say, wait a sec, is it increasing right across the border? Or is it genuinely being stamped out? Is it just moving or is it being diminished in a meaningful sense? And so I just want to take a step back and call out again in this example, like in the other examples, the three steps that we keep seeing. Find a minimum viable product that works, driven by a small team with a nimble organization. Dog food it within a single shop that's not too large. Refine it, work out the kinks, and scale it as far as possible. I hope that repetition doesn't spoil the prayer here. <laughs> I know I've been hitting this point a little bit hard, but I think it's the core of what we ha we're here to talk about today. Um, and, and I think that it applies to a very wide range of scenarios. OK, so what about you guys? You may not have a consumer product, may not have a website, may have never even met an interaction designer, which is totally fine. I still think that these principles are directly relevant to the work that you do. Because there's one thing that we all have, which is users. You know, I used to work on an advertising product at Google. And there's a saying that I learned that stuck with me, which is, when you run an ad on TV, you're doing it for three kinds of people. Your customers, your employees, and your bosses. <laughs> Everyone has users. We all have customers of some sort, employees of some sort, and bosses of some sort. One DC think tank, for example, did the exercise of drawing up their users, including the list of 300 people in the executive branch they were trying to influence. Those 300 people didn't necessarily opt into being on that list. But whether they knew it or not, they were core users of that think tank's output and message. Think about your extracurriculars, your jobs after college, your planned careers. Who are the users that you would be interacting with? And what are their goals? How can data and information help achieve those goals? Here's a concrete thing we can all do sometime or later, sometime or other this coming year. Sooner or later, I guarantee you'll need to make a website to show off some kind of project that you've done, whether it's a class project, extracurricular project, professional project. When you do, start with this question. Who are the intended users? Professors? Undergrads? Journalists? Policymakers? And what do you expect them to be looking for when they visit the site? It's probably something specific. Maybe it's statistics. Maybe it's a poll quote. Maybe they want a single graph that gives them a basic lay of the land. But I'll tell you what they probably don't want. They probably don't want to rehash of the same content they could get on Wikipedia. Because that's probably where they got to before they got to your site. And so when you think about what to include, strip away the pieces that are not relevant to the user goals. It's a little bit different than, I think, the way that sometimes we're trained and sometimes the habits we get into. But you have to recognize that your website will not exist in a vacuum. It will be part of what's already out there. And so think about the need that it solves that can't be solved by the stuff that's already online. You could even draw up a little script of questions and interview a dozen target users to get a sense of their needs. You could show them some mock-ups of the site and ask them in as neutral and unbiased a way as possible what they would do if they were on a site that looked like that, and what would excite them and what would disappoint them. You could even put Google Analytics or a similar logging tool on your site and check the time on site and the abandonment rate on every page. And if you were going to hire a vendor to build it, you could stipulate in the contract and in the relationship that the vendor would implement some changes after the site went live, a plan from day zero to iterate. We keep coming back to the same product management fundamentals. Focus on the user, focus on shipping a minimum viable product, and iterate. 
collect qualitative feedback, collect quantitative feedback, and plan to adjust course as you go. I will note, though, I think it's important to choose the feedback you collect very carefully. If you look at uh, unemployment, for example, in this country, you know, we get this sort of quantitative feedback every month as a society of how many people are out of a job this month. And that drives a lot of our policy making. But I've always felt that that seems a little bit backwards because we know that there are about 3 million people, uh, 3 million jobs, excuse me, uh, looking for people. There are more jobs, you know, all sorts of jobs in all sorts of industries uh, where they can't find the right person to hire. And so what if we took that statistic, broken down by industry, and pushed it out every month along with the unemployment statistic? What if we said, here are the industries that are most desperate to hire people, but they just can't find the right people? How does that change the debate? How does that change the way that we think about addressing the problem if we're collecting that quantitative feedback instead of just the unemployment quantitative feedback? There's an old Henry Ford quote that I really like, which was he said that if he had given people what they said they wanted, he would have given them faster horses. But he didn't give them faster horses. He gave them cars. So it's important to think through what the underlying goal is and design a feedback loop that will really achieve that goal in a way that works. If you take away one idea from today, take away this. There's a new technological and intellectual toolkit out there for managing information, and it works best through rapid, focused iteration based on the user's needs and feedback. But before we close, I think it's worth exploring the downsides of the product management philosophy. The world of policy, the world that many of you live in, is built on relationships. And relationships take time and trust to grow. And you can't surge them. Your world has impressed upon me in a deep way that that kind of relationship building is based on trust. And there's no substitute for human courage in it. Some things, I think, will always be more an art than a science. And it's important to take that into account. I'll also admit that the quest for a minimum viable product can be a little bit ADD. It can abandon projects before they're polished. It can be hard to track. It can be hard to get a handle on from the outside. It doesn't play well with others. It doesn't optimize for reliability. When you're building a standalone app like Angry Birds, a little bit of unreliability is not a bad thing, not a terrible thing at least. But when you're building a platform that sits at the intersection of complicated systems and huge organizations with really precise needs, reliability is key. Look at what happened with Obamacare, for example. Right? You absolutely need to be reliable in a case like that. Look at the IT backbones of the DOJ, DHS, HHS, the defense community. Look at the glue connecting the 50 states in America. Look at the glue connecting America to the world. All of these things are fundamentally so important that it makes a lot of sense to be conservative. It makes a lot of sense to be a little bit wary of ship quick and iterate, a little bit wary of, oh, we'll get something, we'll iterate, we'll see how it goes. We don't know exactly where we're heading yet. So I sympathize and empathize with a more conservative mindset that many folks in the policy world take to this kind of iterative Silicon Valley style product development. But I think it's also worth noting that technology is changing. It's gotten easier and easier to run a server in the cloud, easier and easier to use open source libraries to save programming time, easier and easier to use plug and play web services as modular building blocks. And the result of this is that more and more challenges can be effectively tackled with a minimum viable product developed by small iterative teams. And so I believe that technology can help fight conflict, instability, and repression if it's given a fighting chance. So to recap, when you want to build the minimum viable product, here is what to do. Be clear on your goal. Recruit techies and listen to them. Go to product design trainings. There are plenty of online and offline courses popping up. Delegate. Let teams iterate quickly and cut down the amount of time for planning in between cycles. Institute clear feedback loops and success metrics. Avoid self-design. Remember our old buggy boo from the start of this conversation. Remember the user. Listen to what the user says and to the goals underneath that. And stay flexible. You got to stay flexible. In Moliere's classic play, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, Monsieur Jourdain learns that every spoken word is either poetry or prose. He exclaims, these 40 years, I've been speaking in prose without knowing it. Excuse my terrible French accent. 
one could provocatively say that the mindset of product management and the minimum viable product is a poetry of sorts. It's not the only way of speaking, and often it's not the appropriate way of speaking. But when you have a clear goal and a user worth optimizing around, it packs a special punch. My comments today are not the final word. Technology and practices will continue to evolve. But amid life's prosaic blur, my best advice is to learn the poetry of product management. Thank you.